Hello, denizens. If you've come here to watch yet another boring M1 Mac versus Intel Mac comparison video, you can go away. You've come to the wrong place. Hackintoshers want to know whether the M1 Mac provides the value proposition that could finally make Hackintoshing irrelevant. I have an M1 MacBook Pro, and I'm going to put it to the test against both my Intel and AMD Hackintoshes. Stay tuned. It's going to be exciting. Fight to the death. <laughs> Testing my three systems was very revealing, but very narrowly focused on my use cases. I'm not compiling code. I'm not plugging in Universal Apollo DAX to Thunderbolt. This is what I wanted and needed from my M1 MacBook Pro. Number one, my 2015 MacBook Pro was showing its age. It had a low res screen and I could not conveniently edit video anymore without creating proxies, etc. Number two, we're spending more time, my wife and I, uh, traveling in our RV and I wanted to be able to edit and post video remotely. Number three, I shoot in 4K, usually vlog, but edit in a 2K timeline. Number four, it needs to work with my Edderall DAC, Logic, Final Cut, Affinity Photo and Draw, Viscosity VPN, Microsoft Remote Access, Zoom, and Evernote. Number five, I must be able to use Terminal to manage our Proxmox VMs on our remote servers. Number six, it must have a great keyboard, because I type a lot. And that's about it. Nothing really outrageous. Of course, speedy, smooth, reliable operation is a bonus we all expect with new gear. While this video will have some data and graphs, it's not really a technical video. Please view this as my personal journey in Hackintoshing. And speaking of gear, this is what I'm comparing. My M1 MacBook Pro, which you saw earlier, 13 inches, 8 gig of RAM and 256 gig drive, the base model. Next up, my 8 core i7, 10700 stuck into a gigabyte Vision G motherboard, Radeon 7 GPU, 32 gig of RAM, knocked to a cooler, a 500 gig Western Digital Black NVMe, 750 watt EVGA power supply. Finally, the AMD Hackintosh just laying out on my table like a splayed chicken. Ryzen 6 core, 3600X processor using the supplied cooler. MSI X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi motherboard. Yes, I know it sucks. Shut up. 500 gig Western Digital Black NVMe. Sapphire RX 580 GPU. And some spare EVGA power supply I keep handing in case of emergencies. I found some of the test results more interesting and instructive than anticipated, and I think you will too. This is going to be fun. Now, as always, I offer the usual caveat. While I'm a pretty competent Hackintosher, I'm not an expert. I'm sure someone will pop into the comments with uh, solutions to the shortcomings I'm presenting here, and I, and I welcome them. We all welcome them. So, with that aside, let's proceed. In this first one, you can see the single and multi-core scores, and it shows just how competitive these three systems are from a processor perspective. For a laugh, I threw in the 10700K iMac Apple model uh, that they're selling for a silly amount of money. It's a K chip without the K performance, typical Apple. This Apple nonsense is exactly the reason I Hackintosh. Onto the metal scores, this shows pretty much what others have said, that the GPU in the M1 is rated at about a speed of an RX 560-ish. The Radeon 7 and the RX 580 outpace the M1, but as you'll see from the Final Cut render scores, this doesn't really tell the whole story of the M1 package. I chose a short three and a half minute video shot in vlog with color correction and a green screen key. As I said earlier, I shoot at 4K and then edit at 2K. So 
that makes it a bit easier in Final Cut. But I, I'm going to be re rendering out both in 2 and, and 4K for this, for this uh, particular test. Before I get to the render tests, I just want to say that the overall editing experience on all three machines is pretty much the same to me. But then again, I'm not editing ProRes RAW or Red RAW. The first chart is my three and a half minute test video output at 2K in both H.264 and H.265. The M1 and Intel are neck and neck, but still remember that the Radeon 7 alone cost more than an M1 Mini. You'll notice that the AMD system is actually faster at H.264 compression, but completely loses it when trying to crunch H.265. For reference, I have the Intel Hackintosh set up with the iMac 20,1 SM BIOS with the iGPU QuickSync turned on. The AMD has no iGPU assist available, so it's set up with the iMac Pro 1,1 SM BIOS. In H.264, the, the output uh, on the RX 580 was fully utilized. When it came to H.265, the Mac OS used only the CPU for some reason, hence the long render times. On the Intel box, it was fully cranking both the Intel iGPU and Radeon GPU. You can tell by this green squiggly thing that QuickSync is engaged. How did things go at 4K? Curiously, the Intel hack fell behind the M1 MacBook and also the AMD hack at H.264. But at H.265, I gave up on the AMD. This made me ponder what would happen if I turned off QuickSync on the Intel box. At the top in this chart, you can see the previous scores of the M1 MacBook. The second row, I have the recommended iMac 20, 1 SM BIOS, but with the iGPU turned off. As you can see, it worked fine at H.264, but crapped out totally when attempting H.265. So when I kept the uh, iGPU offline, but switched to the iMac Pro 1,1 SM BIOS, which does not expect an iGPU, this gave similar results to the AMD. In fact, the H.264 compression was even faster but H.265 was, again, a bust. The GPU was in full use for H.264, but not accessed at all for H.265. Unless there is a solution for GPU utilization for H.265 rendering on AMD Hackintosh, I would stick with Intel Hackintoshes with QuickSync for any video work. But ignoring that for the moment, and substituting the same graphics card for both Intel and AMD hacks, the performance of that 6-core Ryzen is on par with the 8-core 10700 and for a lot less money. So if you don't care about H.265, maybe just go with the Ryzen. Or maybe abandon the Hackintosh ship entirely and buy one of these little M1 bastards, which is a good segue to pricing. You'll find this chart sobering and hilarious at the same time. I priced out uh, the two systems that I have, similar to what I tested here, uh, with all the accoutrements needed to get them up and running. I'll include the PC part picker links in the description below. Oh, and please don't tell me what other components I should have used. I tossed these together as a rough guide you can change the parts to whatever you goddamn want. Okay, my M1 MacBook came in at the standard $1,300, my 10700-1720, the 3600X came in at 1118 the hacks included 2.5K displays, I mean, I had to put displays on all of them because the MacBook comes with a display. Yes, I'm comparing a portable to desktops, but that only makes this Compero more extraordinary. I also included, for massive laughs, the still-for-sale Intel Mac Mini outfitted with 16 gig of RAM and an i7 CPU, which clocks in at an eye-watering $1,499 and no monitor. But right below is the M1 Mac Mini with monitor at $1,130. 
nice of Apple to provide both the joke and the punchline <laughs> all on the same page on their website. But it did make me think, what exactly makes the Intel Macs so expensive? I'm sure Apple has extracted great chip pricing from Intel. Is it the engineering involved to accommodate them? Certainly the R&D involved with creating the M1 was far greater than buying just the chips from Intel. But who knows? Apple is not afraid of playing the long game. Just one of the many things that came to mind while making this video. Now, notwithstanding the extraordinary performance of the M1 Max, you still might be uncomfortable with a sealed, non-upgradable box with only two USB-C ports. A few more on the Mini. The performance Apple has managed to extract from less than traditional RAM configurations is sobering. While I have railed against Apple's closed boxes. I am encouraged by the low TDP. Let's not forget all this power I have demonstrated in this video is available on the M1 at only 10 watts. 10 freaking watts. And not the 95 of the Ryzen, which is quite accurate, or the 65 watts of the Intel, which is a total lie. The M1 is an 8-core-ish computer. It has 4 high-speed cores and 4 lazing around doing nothing much cores. My 10700 has 8 cores and 16 threads. That is just crazy. That is the story here. Ultimately, heat is the great killer. This bodes well for reliable M1 Max, but only time will tell. For many professionals who were abandoned by Apple and built Hackintoshes, I'm sure they would be more than happy to entertain a Mac Mini, the M1 Mac Mini, and get back to a more normal experience. Kind of like trading in your manual for an automatic because it just got tiresome driving standard. In conclusion, the Sword of Damocles has been hanging over the Hackintosh community since its inception. Its death has been predicted many times. For the last few years, people, mostly outside the community, were telling us that the end was going to come with the proliferation of T2 security chip-enabled Macs. So far, that has not been an issue. Hell, Apple has locked out their own users because of T2 chip malfunctions, whereas we Hackintoshers continue to use our computers reliably without issue. Then, of course, we were not unaware of Apple's impending move to ARM processors. Yes, existentially, that is an issue, but what has been a total surprise to me is the shocking performance of the M1 Max. If you're a professional who turned to Hackintoshing like me, listen up. And just to be clear, I don't care about you people who are fishing out old Asus portables out of dumpsters and asking us on the forums, can I Hackintosh this? My builds have always been faster than any of Apple's similar offerings, and it solved the biggest problem I had with Macs, thermal throttling. That was hugely offensive. Oh, and so was that fucking fusion drive. And now we come to the M1 Max. Startling performance. No thermal throttling. Quiet, amazing portable life, and a challenge to the Hackintosh price to performance ratio thingy. So far, I'm thoroughly enjoying my M1. This entire video was scripted and produced on it with nary a complaint while playing Nightwish in the background with the aid of, where is it? This giant IO gear dongle. Yeah, you'll, you'll need something like this. So long denizens. I hope you found this lengthy video useful. I really enjoyed producing it for you. So long.